Okay, good. So, um, so in the last hour, I tried to give an overview of how we could understand topological invariance in different dimensions. Um, and so this, and that's kind of developments that have evolved over the past 10 years. Um, what the aim for the next hour is to more move into, well, what is the research that people are doing now? And in particular, what is some of the research that I've been working on now um, more in the past couple of years? Um, and so the subject of this is, uh, is our paper called Topological Quantum Chemistry. Um, and this is, this has been, so that when I, when I finally get into the research level of stuff, then this has been a big group project um, with Andre, who is here, um, and also the rest of this team. Um, and this has been kind of a fun team project because it's some combination of a little bit of physics, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of group theory, um, putting everything together. And, and that's why we got all these people together who are experts in different aspects of this. So, okay, but, but then first I wanted to say, um, so we ended with this table, and you might have thought when you saw this table, well, all of the classification is done, what more do we have to do? Um, but the, the point is that this table, the symmetries that are here are only a selection of symmetries, which are called on-site symmetries, because they leave single lattice sites invariant. So time reversal symmetry leaves single sites invariant, and particle hole symmetry um, has the same effect. So, what we can then consider is, well, crystal lattices have a lot of other symmetry, not only translation symmetry, but lots of crystal symmetry. And it turns out that these crystal symmetries can also protect topological phases, and these sorts of phases are not going to be captured in this table. And so that's what I want to, um, to, to get into right now. So first off, um, the, sorry, the resolution is not very good, but what, what do we have in terms of crystal symmetry? Well, first we have point groups, so the point groups are operations that leave a single site unchanged. So we can consider these come in a few different types. One is the rotation. So I'll say a C4 rotation is rotation by 90 degrees, C3 rotation is 120 degrees, et cetera. Um, there's also mirror planes. So mirror plane is you pick some plane, and then the symmetry operation is reflection through that plane. So maybe Z goes to minus Z, but X and Y are unchanged. And then there's also inversion symmetry, which takes X to minus X, Y to minus Y, Z to minus Z. And then finally we have roto inversion. So roto inversions are rotation symmetry followed by inversion symmetry. So maybe you do a C4 rotation and then, and then flip all your coordinates. So those are what's called point group symmetries because all of those have at least one point which is fixed by that operation. So now what we're talking about crystals, we also have lattice symmetries. And so the lattice symmetries, um, all the different possible lattice symmetries fall into the 14 different Brave lattices. So the Brave lattices are the different ways that we can fill 3D space with solid objects. But you can see even when we do this, there's many different ways to do it. So it's not just that we have X, Y, and Z axes, but if we have three-fold symmetry, then we'll have kind of a hexagonal way of filling space. And it turns out that there's these 14 different ways to do it. So when we combine the point group symmetries and the Brave lattices, um, all together we end up in 3D space with 230 space groups. These are all the possible lattice symmetries that you have in three-dimensional space. It's not obvious where this number 230 comes from because these things can combine in non-trivial ways. We can't, and furthermore, they can't all combine with each other. So for example, if you have a point group with C3 symmetry, you can't combine that with a cubic Brave lattice. So there's kind of some subtle combinations in here, but in the end of the day, there's 230 different space groups. So, okay, so that's what our starting point is. Now, how, do, how can we get topological states out of this? Well, the first example of this was um, introduced by Liang Fu, and he coined this phrase, topological crystalline insulator. And so he was pointing out if we have a C4 or a C6 rotation symmetry and also time reversal, we can have the same attribute where we have a bulk band structure, which is insulating, so we have some energy gap right here and everywhere. Um, but for these states, um, you, will all, you can also have surface states but now you only see the surface states on certain surfaces. So for example, uh, if we have the C4 symmetry, so this lattice here has a C4 symmetry, which is that we can just rotate the cube by 90 degrees, um, there's only one C4 axis. And so if we, make a, if we look at a surface, which is what we'll call the Z normal surface, it's perpendicular to the Z axis, then that surface has C4 symmetry. 
But if we look along the y direction or the x direction, the x or y normal surfaces, then we don't have this symmetry. And so when you look along the x or y direction, you won't see surface states. But when you look along the z normal surface, you do see surface states. So that's one difference between topological crystalline insulators and, for example, the z2 index. For the time reversal protected topological insulators, you see surface states no matter what direction you look. Here, you have to look in certain directions. And then furthermore, in this particular example, the surface states are quadratically dispersing because the C4 symmetry actually constrains the dispersion that you can have. Um, more generally, the point is that if you have crystal symmetries on your surface, they might constrain you to have different things besides the linear crossings or the Dirac cones that we always saw um, for the Z2 examples. So in this particular example, it turns out that there's a Z2 invariant and again, it takes a complicated form, but there's actually some more simple examples um, which came out before this paper. Um, and so, so that's kind of the ones that I wanna focus on. So, so the first example is called a mirror churn insulator. So this was actually introduced in 2008. Um, and so, so some people might, mm, the term, you know, Liang Fu coined the term topological crystalline insulator. I think the mirror churn insulator is also a topological crystalline insulator. And so there's just some notation um, that different people are using differently. I would like to use topological crystalline insulator to be, to refer to any topological insulator which is protected by crystal symmetry. So in other words, if you took away the crystal symmetry, your surface states would disappear, but if you have it, they're protected. And so one example of this is the mirror churn insulator. So what is this? Um, we can look at the real space lattice here, and we can see that this lattice has many different mirror planes. So if we take a slice of it, we can reflect from one side to the other. That's a mirror plane. And because of the cubic symmetry, there's actually many of them. So now, within each one of these mirror planes, um, that means that mirror symmetry uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian. We can ask that, well, since the mirror symmetry commutes with the Hamiltonian, that means that each of the eigenstates also has a mirror eigenvalue. We can simultaneously diagonalize. So, um, so that means each of the mirror each of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian has either a plus or a minus mirror eigenstate, and we can consider those states separately from each other, the plus and the minus, because they don't mix with each other. So then we can talk about eigenvalue sectors. So when I say the plus sector, I just mean all the eigenstates that have a plus eigenvalue. So you can look within one particular sector of mirror eigenvalues, and then when you do that, you can ask in that sector, do you have a churn number? And you can do the same thing for the other sector. If you have time reversal, the sum of these two sectors must be zero. So you really only need to look at one of the mirror sectors. So the mirror churn insulator is a state where if we look at one plane of the Hamiltonian and look at the churn number just in that plane and just within one mirror sector, we'll see that the churn number is not zero. And, this, um, and so this was predicted to occur in tin telluride, predicted and then also, um, also measured later later in the same year. And so what does the band structure look like? Well, I didn't, I guess I didn't draw the bulk band structure. If we look at the surface band structure, we see that this is going from minus pi to pi um, in the x direction. We see that there's these two crossings here. And if we look at the mirror eigenvalues, actually what happens is that this up, this positively sloped band here, and this positively sloped band here, they both have the same mirror eigenvalue. And similarly, this negatively sloped band and that negatively sloped band also have the same mirror eigenvalue. And so since there's two surface states with the same slope, that corresponds to a churn number of two. So in this instance, um, we would say that this has a mirror churn number of two because within one mirror sector, you have a churn number of two. And so this is kind of a neat example because we have these two different crossings here. So if we looked at the Z2 invariant just with time reversal symmetry, we would say it's zero because we had this trick, which is we can go from zero to pi, look at half the Bruin zone and count the number of crossings. And there's two crossings. So the even parity meant that it was zero. So this has no churn number, trivial Z2 invariant, but when we have mirror symmetry, we can say that there's a mirror churn number of two. And so this is how crystal symmetry can refine the classification of topological insulators. And the neat thing is that this was actually, um, so here's showing some of the data of measurements of tin telluride. And what's happening here is that the Fermi level is not, maybe this is an easier picture to see, the Fermi level is actually just below the Dirac point. And so they kind of measure the bits of the cones, which are these little bits here, um, and they don't see the actual crossing. So does this, are, are there any questions about this? Yes? 
No, this is not. So the quadratic touching was specific to the C4 symmetry. Here it's linear. Yeah. Um, it doesn't in general need, there's no symmetry that would protect it, so uh, protect its tiltness. And so um, I guess that's one difference with the Z2 Kramer's pair, since they're occurring at k equals zero and there's a k to minus k symmetry, that's protected. These crossings are occurring at generic k points, so they don't have a symmetry that relates the opposite sides of them. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is, we, yeah, we shouldn't worry about this detail right now, but what happens is mirror symmetry would, um, for a spinless system, square to plus one. For a system with spin, it squares to minus one. The reason is the same reason that a C2 rotation gives you a minus one. So I wrote, although it, since the resolution is not so good, you can't really see, but I wrote plus i and minus i because it's squaring to, plus, to minus one, but th it that's just because there's fermions, okay? That, so if it was a spinless system, it would square to plus one and minus one. Um, the the physics that we see, you know, you can still have the same effect. Correct. We need to expand that, and that's exactly where I'm going. So that those symmetries, like I said, those are only the on-site symmetries. Mirror symmetry is not on site. The reason is because you take planes above the mirror plane, you take a point above the mirror plane and reflect it below the mirror plane. That's not an on site symmetry. It moves some sites to other sites. So, so those things are what I'll call crystal symmetries because they take points in your lattice and move them to other points in the lattice. The Alton Zirnbauer tenfold way is only on site symmetry. So all of this crystal symmetry is outside of that classification. Okay, good. So mirror churn insulator is our first example or our second example of uh, topological crystalline insulator. Um, and then I also want to point out, since this has been getting a lot of buzz um, lately, what's a non-somorphic symmetry? So the, the term is somewhat of a misnomer, which is why it's in quotes, but that's not really the point. The point is that there's certain symmetries that aren't point group symmetries. One of these would be a screw. So a screw symmetry is when you do a rotation and then translate by a partial lattice vector. This doesn't leave any point fixed because everything is at least moving up and some points are also rotating. So this is not a point group symmetry. Um, and, and then the other type of symmetry like this is a glide symmetry. So a glide symmetry is something where you rotate and then move by half a lattice uh, vector. And so the, the cutest picture to show this is a pair of footprints where you can reflect, you can reflect across this axis and then move by half a lattice vector. And of course, the reason that this is half a lattice vector is because the full lattice vector um, is where you're completely translation invariant. So, um, so for uh, glide symmetry, it's always half a lattice vector because, and then when you perform the operation twice, you get a full translation. So you flip and go by half and then flip back and go by another half. Um, a screw symmetry, if it's a two-fold rotation, it's also half a lattice vector. If it's a three-fold rotation, it could be a third of a lattice vector. And so as an example, this lattice that I've drawn here has both glide and screw symmetry. So you can see um, if you rotate by a C6 rotation, you kind of interchange these brown and gold sites. Um, but then if you do half a lattice vector up to the next label, uh, next layer, you get from a brown to a brown site. So these are non-somorphic symmetries. They can also have interesting, um, protect interesting topological phases. And so the, the first example of this was our, it's called an hourglass fermion. So this is how it works. Um, we have a glide symmetry, which is in this lattice that I showed. The glide symmetry has the feature that it squares to a lattice translation because you reflect and translate up and then you reflect back and translate up. So if you do it twice, you get a translation. So if we call G X to be our glide operator, then when we square it, we'll get a translation and we represent translations by E to the I K, E to the I K Z if we're doing it in the Z direction. Um, and the minus sign just comes from this, this fact of having spin. And furthermore, in this crystal, if we also have time reversal symmetry that squares to minus one, what's gonna happen is that, um, is that these symmetries can constrain our surface states in a kind of a funny way. So, so now I'm gonna try to draw a possible surface state. So I'm gonna be thinking about the Y normal surface. So if we're normal to the Y direction, we have KX and KZ as good, um, as good quantum numbers. So now we can fix KX equals zero and just look along KZ. And there's gonna be some bands, conduction bands and valence bands, but we wanna look at the surface. 
So what happens is we can look at kx and kz equals zero. At kz equals zero, our glide symmetry squares to minus one. So that means that our, our eigenstates will have glide eigenvalues of plus or minus i, and they can be a Kramer's pair in that way. So, um, so we have two states, plus i and minus i. As we move across the Bruin zone, this eigenvalue changes. So this is kind of a weird feature of non-symorphic symmetries. Their eigenvalue has k dependence. So plus i becomes minus one. Now at this point, we also need a Kramer's pair. So the Kramer's pair will now be minus one and minus one um, because Kramer's pairs always pair complex conjugate eigenvalues. So then what you can see is that these red and blue lines can't connect with each other because a minus i wants to become a plus one. So the only way that we can fill this in is by making this zigzag shape, which looks like an hourglass, if you, if you know what an hourglass looks like. Um, it has these bottom and top lobes and it has this crossing point in the middle. So that's where this name comes from. When we have non-symorphic symmetry, which is preserved on the surface, instead of just getting a Kramer's pair of points that cross, we have to get this whole zigzag pattern. And the interesting thing about this crossing is like the mirror churn crossing we saw, it's not occurring at a high symmetry point. It can move around depending on the surface um, details. And there is another way that we can fill this, um, fill this in, which is uh, we can see that these relations are also satisfied of having Kramer's pairs of plus i and minus i, and then um, minuses and pluses on the, at k equals pi. Um, satisfied by this configuration. So this configuration is actually the same thing as the spin hall configuration that we already showed. Um, this is half the Bruin zone and you can see if you cross at any point, you always have an odd number of crossings. So when you have a glide symmetry on the surface, there's two possibilities in this plane. One is the usual quantum spin hall effect, uh, this kind of complete zigzag. The other is this hourglass shape. And I'm only showing you one slice of the surface because the surface is actually a 2D Bruin zone and what happens as you move away from this slice um, is that you can get other sorts of zigzags. And so the most interesting case, which was predicted in this um, mercury potassium antimony material is you see this hourglass here. It's kind of squinched up because if you remember the topological features, they're required to exist, but the surface, the microscopic details affect their dispersion. So it ends up being kind of squished like this. But then as we look along the other lines in the Bruin zone, we have these other bands that connect the, the conduction and valence bands. And so this is a true topological state in the sense that the conduction and valence bands are connected to each other. They just don't connect along this one plane that we were looking at. So this is, um, so this was uh, predicted to exist um, in this mercury potassium antimony material. And then, um, and then this is actually some points that were obtained in a measurement by this group um, after the prediction. So this is one of the, other examples of topological crystalline insulators which are um, predicted and measured in real materials. Any questions about non-symorphic symmetries? Okay, made no sense or a lot of sense. Um, good. Oh yeah, the only reason I was saying that is because um, technically the Technically, th there's non-symorphic space groups and there's not a meaning to having a non-symorphic symmetry. And the reason for this is actually, you can have space groups that don't have screw or glide symmetries, but, but still have this feature of having symmetries that don't leave points fixed. Because for example, if you have um, like two different rotations which have different rotation axes, it might be if you chose one basis, one origin where you had, where one of them left a point fixed and the other one would kind of look like in non-symorphic symmetry. So, so there's, so there's non-symorphic space groups. There's not really non-symorphic symmetries, but somehow I think colloquially this term of a non-symorphic symmetry is being used in the literature. And so I don't think anyone will, will care if you abuse it in that way. Um, but a screw and a glide symmetry are the proper terms. And the definition of those two things is that they don't leave a single point fixed, no matter what origin you choose. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, so that's a, this is a very good question. <laughs> so, um, so one thing, I think there's two possibilities that can happen. Um, so because we have time reversal symmetry, everything basically gets doubled. So we had a two-fold symmetry, but we actually had four bands here. If you had a three-fold symmetry applying the same logic, you would get six bands. And what happens is that the eigenstate 
it basically takes three cycles of the Bruin zone in order to change back to itself. And so this thing, if we kind of trace this band, we would see that plus i, minus one, it would actually, if we went all the way to two pi, it, the plus i state would turn into a minus i state. And it would take a whole nother cycle to get back to a plus i state. With threefold, that would take three cycles. And then one question is, do you get like a, a triple of this thing um, and I think there's actually two possible connectivities. I think there's a way to connect it so that you split into two different pieces, three bands that connect and three bands that connect. I, I think that might be true, maybe without time reversal. But yeah, I guess the, probably the thing that I know is true is it takes three cycles of the Bruin zone to, to connect, yeah. And I don't know if there is a topological state protected by, like I haven't heard of, um, I haven't seen an example of a phase which is protected by that, I think, because people haven't looked into that specific case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the eigenvalues can be complex. They square the e to the i kz, and kz is changing, so they actually will be complex. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. So, what happens is the glide symmetry squares to a translation. Translation we represent in terms of block in block states on e to the i k, and so the eigenvalues of this thing will be plus or minus i times e to the i k over two. And so then, as we vary k, they change their eigenvalue, and that's what the exchange is because it has a k over two in it. Um, yeah. So, um, what would you measure in the experiment here? You the easiest thing to measure would be to just use ARPES and measure the presence of the states and not measure the eigenvalues. But I don't think that there's an obstruction to measuring a complex eigenvalue. You could probably, you, you know, how you would do the measurement, I'm not sure of, yeah. <laughs> they always come with pairs, yeah. Kramer's pairs. Yeah. But in general, I don't think there's an obstruction to having a complex eigenvalue and being able to measure it. I mean, the question is how you measure it. Well, you're going to measure something real. You're not going to measure the eigenvalue directly. And probably what you'd measure is spin. Maybe you could get spin in some polarization to couple to one of these and see some excitation. So you wouldn't measure the eigenvalue directly, but there's no, I don't think that there's an obstruction to having a complex eigenvalue. Uh, yeah, the surf so I didn't, there's actually several possible surface configurations. This one looks gapped. What you need to ask what happens around the other, in the other directions. And it can actually be gapped and have this thing be standing alone. It can also have no surface states. There's no obstruction to that. Or it can have kind of the thing I drew here, which is you have the hourglass, but it also has these states. Yeah, so there's several configurations. Uh, I mean, the, the, the perception in the first region. Ah, this. Uh, these have different eigenvalues, so they're protected. Yeah, so if you have this configuration by itself and no states that go up and down, you can get rid of it. So actually, this by itself is kind of trivial because we could continuously push it. But if you look in the other sectors and have these lines here, then as you try to push it up here, you'd be left with other, other states kind of coming up. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that if you extend to the um, infinity of the symmetry, mm -hmm. the symmetry is used in the mm -hmm. non-commutative way. Yeah. So what I know is that in the infinity of the symmetry, the surface states are the fact that your symmetry is small. Yeah. So, so by doing it, you're not. Yes. So actually, um, the AZ. It's not straightforward to extend that class. So what I wanted to say, whether or not I said it, was that the crystal symmetries are not included in that classification, and you would have to extend it in order to capture crystal symmetries. Now, on a practical level, how do you do that? You're correct. The AZ method doesn't really, as it's implemented, doesn't work anymore. Um, and so there's other methods that you can use. And so um, they're a lot harder. The classification is not done 
uh, although the method of how to do it has been, I think, has been written out. This is the direction that I'm that I'm kind of going in. Okay, so let's yeah, one more question. Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay, this is actually only half the Bruin zone going from zero to pi. So this actually has a partner. Oh, well, actually, what's your question? You mean depending on where your Fermi level is? Yes. Yeah, so. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure about that. So you could, like actually forgetting about the glide symmetry, you could ask the same question about just quantum spin hall, because you can also have a zigzag of states like this. Um, and the, I think, I think what will happen is that, right, so if we had a quantum spin hall state, it would be like this could be spin up with an upward slope and this would be spin down as a downward slope. And as you move your Fermi level from here to here, you're actually seeing both. You're seeing this span with upward slope, but there's another half of the Bruin zone, which is the other spin with downward slope. And as we move to a higher Fermi level, um, you would see the same thing because this downward slope band had the same spin as the other half of the Bruin zone. So I don't think that there's a contradiction there. Um, there is a special point where you sit right, right at the, Fermi level where things, where you'd have bands exactly at zero. But yeah, I don't think there's a contradiction. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so these are some, so I've shown you some examples of topological crystalline insulators. Um, now, the, so that's kind of the background. Now the question is, um, do we want to find topological phases? Do we want to find materials that realize them? And I, I think for most of us that are interested in kind of pushing forward both the field and also pushing forward technology, the answer would probably be yes. And so there's a few applications for topological phases, uh, which, which is not the purpose of this talk, so I don't really want to go into it. But some examples are here, which are quantum computing, spintronics, and also taking advantage of gapless states and gapless surface states, maybe ultra-fast switches um, that can get between uh, between different states. And so if we have these applications, and maybe we don't even know all the applications we could have yet, the question is, how can we find materials that are going to realize different topological phases? Because the only way to push forward the technology is to actually have better practical, practical materials that can realize this. And this is kind of the, um, the, the important question that we were looking after, um, that we were looking to solve in this work. And so, I think that there's two major challenges in order to finding actual materials. So one of the challenges is um, that there's been a piecewise approach to this classification. So I described to you some of these uh, topological crystalline insulators protected by C4 symmetry, mirror symmetry, glide symmetry, but a real crystal actually has many of these different symmetries, and so it's not clear how these things all combine with each other. And so this raises a question of, um, if you look at, you have some crystal, you look at the valence bands, you want to know, well, what's the topological index of these bands? It could be that you compute all the known indices and they all come out to be zero. That doesn't mean that the bands are trivial. It might mean that you don't have the right index yet. So that's kind of one problem, which is that crystals are complicated. They have a lot of symmetries. How do all these different symmetries interplay with each other? Um, and then the other problem is that we have these abstract topological invariants. So I said some of them, Z, Z2, um, the hourglass actually gives you Z4. So there's all these different labels, but these things are mathematical invariants, and so they don't actually give us any insight into how to find chemical compounds that will realize them. And so that's kind of the big, the big leap is going, is going between the math and actually the chemistry and the physics. And so these are the major questions um, that we are setting out to solve in this theory of topological quantum chemistry. So the idea is that 
We want to be able to diagnose and predict materials, not just classify phases, but have some insight so that we can find more materials and therefore um, make more progress in looking for applications and seeing interesting physics. And so the idea that we're operating on is we've kind of made this notion between uh, separating topological insulators from conventional insulators. And the conventional insulators are the ones where um, we don't have surface states, and so we could consider doing some smooth deformation to where the charges are specifically bound to the atoms. And so we'll call this an atomic limit. So this is kind of your usual, your usual insulator where you think of, well, you have electrons circling different sites, um, different sites are overlapping, but, but in principle we could kind of deform this to a state where each electron is sitting on one atom. A topological insulator doesn't have this property, and that's the reason why we have surface states, is because the electrons are de completely delocalized, um, and furthermore, they cannot be deformed to, these, to this simple uh, atomic limit. And so, so the, idea, um, the idea of our theory, which is in order to, to, um, to search for these topological crystalline insulators, is that we're going to go in the reverse direction. The first thing that we'd want to do is try to enumerate all of the trivial phases that we can have. So we'll enumerate all the atomic limit phases, and then we can identify topological bands to be those that are not trivial. And then, um, and then we have kind of a different ways in which we can more directly search for topological materials, um, and I'll show a couple of examples that we found. So, so the question is then, how do, we, how do we do this step one? How do we identify in a given space group all the trivial atomic bands? And so, um, so this is just a reminder. We're going to talk about 3D. 3D has space groups, but we, we can also talk about 2D, um, which also has equivalent to space groups. So, um, so what we want is to restrict ourselves to a particular space group or a particular set of symmetries and then ask, what are all the different trivial phases that we can have? And you might think, well, isn't there only one of these? But actually, within each space group, there's many different ways that we can arrange atoms and still have this symmetry. So, for example, if we have symmetry of the honeycomb lattice, which is C6 rotation and mirror symmetry, we can actually arrange this in a triangular lattice, a honeycomb lattice, a Calgamay lattice. All of these lattices have C6 rotation, and they also have two different mirror symmetries. The difference between them is what are the symmetries that leave one site invariant? So, for example, in the triangular lattice, each single site has, is the center of a C6 rotation. But in the honeycomb lattice, they're obviously not, and instead each single site is the center of a C3 rotation. The C6 rotation exchanges two different sites. And similarly, in the Calgamay lattice, each site is actually only the center of a, um, of a C2 rotation. And so within each space group, there's many different ways that we can arrange atoms. Um, and the difference between the different ways is what are the symmetries that leave one site invariant? And that's called the site symmetry group. Now, Within each of these different arrangements, there's also a further degree of freedom, which is what are the orbitals that we're talking about? So, for example, if we make a tight binding model, um, there's only a few orbitals that are actually relevant near the, near the Fermi level. Or that there's only a few orbitals that are included in the model. And in a real physical system, there's only a few orbitals that are relevant near the Fermi level. And so, within each of the different ways that we can arrange atoms, we can also ask, what are the orbitals that we want to put onto those atoms? And this will further give us another degree of freedom. And so we consider the definition of an atomic limit phase, which would be topologically trivial, to be an arrangement of, so we stay within one space group, pick the arrangement of atoms, and then pick the orbitals that are sitting on each of the atoms. And that combination of space group, um, atomic site symmetry group, and orbital, orbital symmetry is what defines a trivial atomic limit. And of course, we can have many of these things together, but that's kind of the building block. Now, each one of those combinations completely specifies the symmetry in real space. So if we look at this honeycomb lattice, um, the symmetry that we have is, uh, is the six-fold rotation, but a three-fold rotation keeps one site invariant. And in addition, if we specify s orbitals, then we can, for each symmetry operation in the space group, we can completely see how the symmetries act. C6 will mix the different sites, but leave an S orbital invariant. Um, in contrast, if we picked PX or PY orbitals, the C6 symmetry would not only mix the sites, but it would also mix the orbitals. So we need to specify all of this in order to fully see how the symmetry acts. And once we do this, um, what we end up with is, in real space, we know how the symmetry acts. In momentum space, all we need to do is Fourier transform the symmetry operators, and, and that will um, completely determine how the symmetries act in momentum space. So 
So as an example of this, if we have s orbitals or pz orbitals on a honeycomb lattice, we get the band structure of graphene, which is there's this Dirac point here, and it actually has to be here because this crossing um, is labeled by a two-dimensional irrep, so these bands have to cross. But if we looked at px and py orbitals, we'd see something different. We'd see that there's different labels, um, there's different symmetry labels on the band. So there's not only a two-band crossing, but there's also these single bands. And this is completely dictated by symmetry. So the point is that there's a correspondence between real space and momentum space. And we can think of this as kind of um, inputting our real space degrees of freedom, which is the space group, the atomic positions, and the orbitals, and then turning some crank, and the output of that is the symmetry labels that appear in the Bruin zone. So these are the symmetries that label the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian um, in momentum space. And what this crank really is, is just a Fourier transform. And so this idea um, is what's called a band representation. So, so Zach, the same Zach of the Zach phase, introduced this idea. And so what he wanted to do is say, usually people are looking at single K points in the Bruin zone. You look at one K point, you say, what are the symmetries at that point? And you build a local model near that point. But the question is, if you take two different K points, how do those local models connect to each other across the Bruin zone? And in order to see how they connect, what you need to do is kind of look at the K, look at the local models at every single K point. And so capturing all of those means that you need to look at the whole symmetry band. And so that's why he called it a band representation. Um, so the definition of this would be the symmetry in the entire atomic limit. If you have all the symmetry in real space, then you Fourier transform it and you get the symmetry in K space. And in doing that, you know how symmetry um, acts across entire bands. Now, we can actually, um, we can actually consider multiple orbitals. So I've been talking kind of about one atomic limit, which is just one set of orbitals. But we can also add multiple orbitals, which would happen in any real crystal. There'll be many different sites with many different orbitals. Um, and, and then what happens is that we can do the same Fourier transform. We just get a lot more labels coming out at the bottom. And in fact, there's infinitely many of these combinations because we can always add more atoms with more orbitals. And so this set of atomic limits that we're trying to enumerate is actually infinite. And so the useful thing to do is to divide this into, um, into the most minimal components, and so therefore we can get a finite subset that will span all of these, all these infinite different atomic limits. And so these, this finite subset is called the elementary band representations. And so one way to think of this is if we have a single orbital on a single site and then tile it all over the lattice according to the space group symmetry, then um, then that gives us an elementary band representation. If we put another orbital on that site then, and then continue to tile it, then that gives us another elementary band representation. Together, they're not elementary, but each one separately is. And the way that we get topological insulators is if we create band inversions between these two different elementary ones. So for example, in, um, for example, in Mercury Telluride, what happens is you have S orbitals, they form one elementary band representation. You have P orbitals, they form another. But at one point in momentum space, they actually invert with each other. And so if you just looked at the valence bands or just looked at the conduction bands, neither one would actually have an elementary, would be an elementary band representation. So these elementary band representations are a way for us to enumerate all of the different atomic limit phases. And the topological bands are exactly those that do not correspond to an elementary band representation. Mm -hmm. I am saying that um, when they mix is exactly how you get topological bands. So if you see, so a trivial group of bands will be one which can be broken down into these elementary components because each of these elementary components came from one of our atomic limit phases which was topologically trivial. So we can make a correspondence which is elementary or sums of elementary give us atomic limit phases and that's kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but because they can mix, and as we see, because they can have gaps in between them, you can have groups of bands that are not band representations, and those are the topological bands. Okay, so, so then our program is that we want to identify all of these um, elementary band representations. Um, we want to identify all the elementary band representations from their real space symmetry. And once we've kind of identified all of them, 
then we can know what topological bands are because they'll be exactly those that aren't the elementary band representation. And the reason we needed these elementary ones is to make the number of atomic limits finite. So if we, if we considered, um, like I said, we could keep adding more and more orbitals, we can have infinitely many atomic limits, but these are kind of the building blocks from which we can build any different atomic limit. You can think of this as the basis of your type binding model. Whenever you make a model that, um, to imitate a crystal, you're only going to include certain numbers of orbitals, but each orbital that you include is like another elementary band representation. And then the hopping terms can cause these to mix in all, in all sorts of complicated ways. So there's only finitely many of these, but the number is not small. The number is around 10,000. And this is um, with, so we can consider with time reversal, without time reversal, with spin orbit coupling, and without spin orbit coupling. And when we consider all four categories together, then we get about 10,000 of these things. So this now becomes a finite number, but a non-trivial um, kind of computational project. So, so this is, so I, I showed the members of our collaboration earlier. Um, so these two guys, Moise and Luis, they run this Bilbao crystallographic server. And so if you haven't had the opportunity to use this, but you're ever trying to make type binding models and think about crystal symmetry, this can be really useful. Um, so on this server, you can look up what the different space groups are and what their symmetries are. So we collaborated with, um, with Moise and Luis in order to enumerate all these elementary band representations and put that data on the Bilbao crystallographic server. So, um, and so to access that data, you can go to this tool, which is called band rep. Um, you can enter a space group number in, and then when you do that, you get out a table that looks like this. And so what these tables are telling us is that um, we're in a particular space group. In this first position, or this first row, it's telling us how are the different atoms arranged. So I kind of showed these different atomic positions, uh, atomic configurations. That's what this first row is telling us. The second row is telling us what are the different orbitals, so s orbitals, p orbitals. Um, these are just the group theory labels of each of those orbitals. And then what these other rows are saying is, if we look at the high symmetry points, how can we label the bands that appear? And so, this, so now all this information is tabulated on the Bilbao crystallographic server, and it's telling us if, if you make a type binding model, even without knowing anything about energetic, I can completely tell you all the symmetry labels that will appear in your type binding model, and you can look them up on the server. I can't tell you which ones will appear in the valence band or the conduction band, because that depends on energetics. So now we've kind of solved this first problem that we have, which is um, I previously showed, well, there is this piecewise classification of topological crystalline insulators. Now suppose we have some band structure and we have some insulating bands. We want to know, are they topological bands or not? Well, previously we only, we didn't have the complete classification, so we didn't know whether these were topological bands or not. Now what we can do is we can look at the symmetry labels at all the high symmetry points, and then we can compare them to the Bilbao crystallographic server. If we see a combination of symmetry labels that didn't appear on the server, then we know that we have topological bands because there is no atomic limit, because um, there is no atomic limit that, that corresponds to these bands. So, th so as long as you have enough symmetry that these symmetry labels can tell you um, that you don't have an atomic limit, then you've identified your topological bands. So this is a complementary approach to the generalization of the alton zirnbauer tenfold way classification that I showed. In that classification, they give you a z-index, but they don't give you a way to compute that index necessarily. Um, this idea is we're not giving you a classification, but instead we're giving you a practical algorithm that can be used um, in order to, if you have a particular band structure, identify whether your bands are topological or trivial bands. So this could give us some way to find topological materials, which is what we could do, and actually um, since, I've, since I've made this slide, then people have gone and done this. Um, but what you could do is say, suppose that we search the crystal structure database. Um, so there's a database of all known crystal structures. And what we could do is for each one of those, we could compute the band structure. And then we could look at all the high symmetry points and we could compute the symmetry labels at each of the high symmetry points. And then we could compare those labels to the ones on our Bilbao crystallographic server. And for each of those compounds whose labels don't appear on our enumeration of trivial band labels, um, we know that we have topological bands. And so this would give us a way to search for topological materials. This is kind of connecting. We didn't actually need a, this abstract topological invariant. This is a way for us to connect the mathematical side of these uh, of things to the chemical side of things. And, um, and I think 
I'll, I'll show some examples of this at the end, and I also want to point out that there's been um, a few works which have kind of carried out this algorithm, one of, one of which Andre is working on, and maybe he'll mention um, a little bit during, during his talks. But what we're interested in, in the first place, is instead of doing this brute force search, is to find some more clever ways in which we can kind of explicitly search for materials that are likely to give us topological bands instead of searching the entire database. So the way that we do this is um, we want to consider the connectivity of these elementary bands. And so we want to consider, given a set of orbitals, can you get an insulator or can you not get an insulator? Um, and so there's kind of this, this interesting historical fact, which is that these elementary band representations that I showed, which are these building blocks, most of them are not able to be gapped. And in fact, these, um, these early papers by Zach and his colleague Michelle um, they were trying to show that, they were trying to prove that elementary band representations could not be realized with a gap. They would always give you a semi-metal. And they wrote papers to this extent um, saying that this is the case. And they said that they present the concepts necessary for a proof. But they actually never really completed this proof. And, um, and there's actually some gaps in the proof. And so we were able to show that there's many examples of elementary band representations that can be realized with a gap. And in fact, one of these examples is, is the symmetry of graphene. So if we consider graphene, which graphene with spin orbit coupling, so this kind of artificial graphene, then um, on each site of the honeycomb lattice, we have up and down spins. Spin orbit coupling tells us that we need to consider both up and down spins and the related by time reversal. And we have two sites in the lattice. And so if we want to make a model of this, the minimal degrees of freedom that we have is four, which is the two spins and the two different lattice sites. And so these things comprise an elementary band representation because they're minimal, because we need all four of them to be related by symmetry. If we, if we have symmetry, we need all four. So we can make a model of this, which is just the kane malay model, um, and we can show that there's an energy gap here. So this is kind of the most trivial example of, maybe not the most trivial, but it's an example of elementary bands that can be realized as an insulator. And what we see is that actually, it has to always be the case that if we have an elementary band representation with, a, with an energy gap like this, that the bands that are separated cannot both be, um, they cannot both be trivial bands. Because if, we, if they were, then this upper half and this lower half would both be elementary band representations, and then their sum would no longer be elementary. So it's the basic fact that these two things together are the most fundamental atomic limit that all four sites together are related by symmetry. Um, that, that actually means that if we have half of it, we can't be elementary. And so this gives us a way to look for topological bands, which is we can find the elementary band representations that can be realized with a gap like this. So they can be split into two different halves. And then the upper half or the lower half, those, those can't themselves be topologically trivial. So this is the way that we now can kind of directly search for, um, for topological materials. But what we need to do is figure out for the elementary band representations, how do the bands connect to each other? So, um, and so the way to figure out the band connectivity is we have all these labels at high symmetry points, um, and then we need to know how they connect. And so it turns out that um, this is, uh, there's a straightforward way to do this, which is for this symmetry label, um, it corresponds to the symmetry of, of all the symmetries that leave this K point invariant. And similarly, if we move to another K point, these symmetry labels um, correspond to the symmetries that leave this point invariant. But in between, you have smaller symmetry. And so what you're going to do is ask, well, if you have an EREP of a group and you break it into a smaller group, how does that EREP decompose into EREPs of the smaller group? And that's a well-defined procedure. So each point here will split in a well-defined way along lines. And at the other side, it will also split in a well-defined way. And these things need to connect to each other. But the, the interesting thing is that this connectivity is not, um, it's not unique. And so for example here, if we look at the symmetry labels at the K point, the gamma point, and the M point, um, these are just different K points. On the left and the right picture, all the same labels appear, but what I've done is exchange the order of these two different EREPs. And so, um, and in exchanging their order and energy, you actually exchange, uh, you actually change the connectivity. And so, for each elementary band representation, it's not unique how the bands connect to each other. And so this is, actually, um, this is actually a harder problem. We've already enumerated all of the elementary band representations and all of the symmetry labels, but figuring out how the bands connect to each other um, is a little bit more tricky. And so there's actually a cute map to do this, which is um, 
which is basically you consider these high symmetry points to be nodes on a graph. And, um, and when you set up the problem this way, you can use a result from graph theory, which tells you is your graph connected or is it not connected? And that, that result um, is the result that we use in order to massively plug in all of these different elementary band representations, set up all the different symmetry labels, and test all these possible connectivities, and then see um, in the output, can we get an insulator, which corresponds to the bands being disconnected or our graph being disconnected, or do we get out a semi-metal? And so this is um, in these tables that I showed from the Bilbao Crystal Graphic Server, this is what this row corresponds to. Can it gap? If it says indecomposable, that means it can't break down. So all the bands are connected to each other. And in those cases, we know that we can't get topological insulators out of just those orbitals because the bands will always connect. You actually can never get an insulator. But in these cases that say decomposable, then those are the bands that can gap with each other, um, that can gap out. And so those are the places where we can look for topological insulators. And so just as an example to show how this works, um, so this is the space group again with the symmetry of graphene. And so we can look through each of these columns and see what, um, and see the physical systems that they would correspond to. So for example, in the first column, the symmetry is that of S and P orbitals on the honeycomb lattice. And we see that it says indecomposable. That means that the system can't gap. And we already know this because this is the symmetry of graphene and we always have this Dirac point and there's no way to get rid of the Dirac point. Now, if we move to the last column, this is the same symmetry of S and PZ orbitals, but now with spin orbit coupling, which changes how the symmetries act. Um, so in this case, we see it is decomposable, which means that you can get a gap. And this is the cane malay model or the colored example that I showed earlier, um, where you can realize these things split in energy. And this gives us a topological insulator, as we already know. But then we can also look at these other columns to see, well, what else can we get on the honeycomb lattice? So for example, this column is the symmetry of PX and PY orbitals with spin orbit coupling. Um, and, and these things can also be gapped. And so this tells us that if we have some system which has PX and PY orbitals near the Fermi level and that they're realized with an energy gap, that will give us a topological insulator. And it turns out that this exactly corresponds to this um, completely independently of our work, this paper that came out, which is describing um, bismuthine, so this is kind of like graphene, but made of bismuth, so it actually has strong spin orbit coupling, and it has different orbitals which are near the Fermi level because of the substrate that they put it on. And so it actually has PX and PY orbitals near the Fermi level, they realize an energy gap, and they were able to show that this realizes um, a topological insulator. And then finally, we can move into something which has not been realized uh, experimentally, which is, um, this is the symmetry of PX and PY orbitals without spin orbit coupling, these can all also be realized with a gap. And so this tells us that if we did have some material with negligible spin orbit coupling, but PX and PY orbitals near the Fermi level and an energy gap, then this would be a way to, this, to realize a topological crystalline insulator with the symmetries of this space group. So, um, so then I think in the interest of, of time, I'll just flash some stuff. Um, so then we wanna use this theory in order to find real materials and so there's a few challenges, which is that basically band structures don't behave as nicely as toy models do. And so there might be a case where in principle you could get a topological insulator, but actually the bands are crossing. They don't have to cross. It's not symmetry required, but it can happen. And that's a bit problematic. Um, and then another problem that can happen is you can get these really small band gaps and there's no way to predict this from symmetry. So from a theory point of view, it's like graphene from spin orbit coupling with spin orbit coupling. You want to say you have a topological insulator, but no experimentalist who measures it is gonna tell you that it's an insulator. So we have a few examples um, of compounds that we found, which is um, this class of copper materials on cubic lattices. And so um, I'll just, I guess I'll just flash through these so there's time for questions. And so these things can, visit, can realize strong TIs. And the nice thing about this method is that since we derived it using symmetry, it applies to a lot of different materials which are all in the same symmetry class. Um, we also found these examples of weak TIs, and so we made this 2D model, and what we learned from this model is that if we have PX and PY orbitals, so again, like bismuth, um, if we look without spin orbit coupling, then we get these Dirac points. But when we turn on spin orbit coupling, then we open a gap. And you can actually show by looking at the symmetry representations that all the bands below the gap are always gonna be topological. Whenever you open this gap, you will get a TI. And there's several materials that realize this. And so this is kind of a cool one because you can see that these crossings, if we just look near the Fermi level, the crossings that appear here are very similar to the ones in our toy model. So the toy model is actually capturing kind of like a one EV range of energy. Um, this is actually one which is slightly distorted. So the crossings aren't as nice. 
Um, and again, the gaps are really small, but these are examples of weak CI. Um, and then there's some examples of file materials. And then also another interesting thing here is that we can show um, how if you strain a material and change its symmetry, how the gaps will open because this will affect the, the EREPs that appear. Um, and so for example, this is a case where we have bands which are touching. If we strain it, we open a gap and then we can get um, a topological gap. So, um, so this is kind of a whirlwind overview and um, I think that Andre will hopefully go through some, of the, some more of the details to actually show how this is executed. But the point is, you know, the altland zirnbauer classification is capturing these on-site symmetries. Um, but crystals have a lot more symmetries than that. And so that's how we can get topological crystalline insulators. Some of these are robust enough to be measured in experiments. And what we're trying to do here is find a systematic way to not only get the topological invariants, which are not super useful, but all super useful if you're wanting to find materials, but find a direct route to be able to predict materials. And that's what this kind of whirlwind overview of the theory is meant to do. So are there any questions in the last few minutes? Yeah, so um, the way to think of this is if you have like one orbital on one site, then you act with your space group symmetry, that'll take you, because you have translations, you'll tile the whole lattice and you act with all your rotations, so you'll end up with a complete lattice. The symmetry of that lattice is completely specified by just the symmetry of that one site because, um, because the, you can tire, tile the entire lattice by acting on one site. That, that gives me symmetry in real space. And then when I Fourier transform that, it tells me about the symmetry labels in momentum space. So the elementary band representation contains both of these information, both of that information, um, the real space symmetry labels and the momentum space symmetry labels because they're one and the same. Um, and what makes it elementary is that it's just one orbital on one site. So it's a one-to-one map. It's a one-to-one -one map of all the information. Now, one thing that we know now is that if you know the symmetry labels, uh, you don't always, it doesn't uniquely determine the real space labels. Yeah. You mean like Weil or Dirac type points? Um, so any type of linear crossing in 3D will always give you, um, if you don't have any symmetry, it'll always give you a vial point. If you, so whenever two bands cross in 3D, that gives you a vial point. Now the question is, if you have degeneracies, it might look like a two band crossing, but it's actually more. Um, so, so I think what you can do is um, locally look at the dispersion, see how the symmetries, the symmetries will dictate the dispersion. If it's linear, you have a vial or a Dirac point. Systematically do it. Yes, so yes, so what you can do, so, so we haven't done this, but it's in principle possible. You could look at each arbitrary point, um, consider the different EREPs at that point, which tells you which bands are allowed to cross with each other. And then the, because, you, because the elementary band representation contains all the symmetry information, you could make a local k.p model or a local model just of that point, and you have all the symmetry that you need to make that model. And that would dictate the dispersion. Ah, that, yeah, I don't think that there's a general recipe for this, and I think that's a really good question because a person might wonder um, if, you have a dis if you have an elementary band representation which can be disconnected, is there a, even a natural or local model that could realize it? And in general, I don't think that question is, um, is answered. In, ed in all the examples that I've worked with, uh, we've been able to find a disconnected model by doing something like adding second nearest neighbor. So I suspect that it's that it's possible, but there's not an algorithm for finding it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think, well, in order to think about the experimental way, what I would want to do, like, so um, in one of the examples that I was showing here, I have a model which, um, which showed me that if I only had next nearest neighbor, or if I only had nearest neighbor hopping, I'd always be connected. The way to open it was to add next nearest neighbor hopping. So then experimentally, what you would ask is, how could I tune between these different parameters? Um, and maybe you, maybe you could realize that by straining it, you would push the next nearest neighbor sites close. You know, so you'd need to connect the models with some experimental um, observable. Yeah. 